My name is Gina Perrill, and it is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. I lead the Institute's external relations efforts here, and public programs like this are a very important part of that work. The Institute is a place where people of all ages and all walks of life can come experience democracy, learn about the United States Senate, express their views, and also learn to find common ground. Senator Kennedy strongly believed that a successful democracy depended on participation. He was a constant advocate for empowering young people to take an active role in their communities. And he envisioned the Institute as a place where they could speak up and be engaged. And that's exactly why the Institute is so proud to be part of this event tonight. The Speak Up, Art is Action, Mass Leap, Youth Spoken Word Exhibition. Also, we're really happy to be part of Art Week as well. So we're gonna hear young poets share their voices and their views on issues connected to the 2016 election and to the nation as a whole. And all of us who work, volunteer, and intern here, we've made a commitment to engaging and hopefully inspiring the next generation of leaders to get and remain involved in the civic life of their communities. And Mass Leap is fully committed to the next generation as well. We're very happy to have Mass Leap co-founders here with us tonight, Alex Harlamides and Amanda Torres. We're also really happy to have each one of you here tonight. So please do come back to the Institute and have the full experience of our exhibits and our daytime programs, because you are always, always welcome here. So now, allow me to make two introductions. So first, Boston City Councilor Andrea Campbell. <laughs> Councilor Campbell was elected to the Boston City Council as District 4 City Councilor in November 2015. Her district primarily includes the neighborhoods of Dorchester and Mattapan, and parts of Roslindale and Jamaica Plain. Councilor Campbell was born and raised in Boston and educated in the Boston Public Schools. We're very honored to have her here to help us open the program. And after Councilor Campbell speaks, Amanda Torres will come up to the microphone. She is co-founder and artistic director of Mass Leap. Ms. Torres is a talented and accomplished performer in her own right, and she'll be introducing the artists tonight. Ms. Torres has served as poet poetry artist in residence at the Institute of Contemporary Art Boston, and is artistic director for Massachusetts Louder Than a Bomb Slam Poetry Festival. So first, please help me welcome Boston City Councilor Andrea Campbell. Good evening. Good evening. Um, wait, hold on. Mic check one, two, one, two. That's the extent of my performance. Um, I just want to say I want to thank the EMK Institute. I want to thank Gina. I want to thank Shagun. I also want to thank Mass Leap for having me today. I am honored to be here because I, I really felt like you should be calling on someone who's either done spoken word or is a good poet, a powerful speaker, and I never tend to put myself in those categories. And so tonight I was wondering, what do I say to these powerful young people in the room who are gonna get up here and really share their stories, share their perspectives on not just the election 2016, but on how they feel about the political system. And what I told myself is, Regardless of how you deliver your story or how you deliver what you're trying to say, it's just important that you speak up. It's important that you let your story and your voices be heard. I am the newly elected District 4 City Councilor, so I actually was sworn in in January. I was elected last year. I replaced a councilor who was there for 32 years. So I took on a task where most people said it was impossible for me to win, don't waste my time, don't step up, don't use my voice, and definitely not get involved. I push back against those assumptions, those assumptions that people have on what young people are capable of, those assumptions that people have on what young people can do. 
I started my campaign by simply sharing my story. I was going door to door in Dorchester, Mattapan, Rosendale, and Jamaica Plain, and just telling people who I was and why I decided to run. I ultimately told them the story about my twin brother. I had a twin brother named Andre. So it was Andre and Andrea. We were both born and raised in Boston. We grew up in Roxbury and later moved uh, to the South End. We went to all Boston public schools. I went to Boston Latin School, the Harvard Kent, the Bradley in East Boston, the Timothy Middle School, as well as the Blackstone. After uh, leaving Latin School, I went off to Princeton University and then UCLA for law school. And I came back to Roxbury to represent little kids in education cases. And ultimately went on to work with Governor Patrick as an attorney and then decided to run for office. My twin brother, on the other hand, had a different story. He cycled in another criminal justice system, ultimately passes away while in the system he was 29 years old. And so I asked myself the question, how do two twins born and raised in the city of Boston have such different life outcomes? And so when I decided to run for office, it was to carry my, not only my brother's story with me, but to answer that question and to work every single day so that we don't have those outcomes happen again. So I would not have stepped up if I didn't feel as though I had power, if I didn't feel as I had power in my voice and in my story. Each and every young person in here, you have incredible stories, I'm sure of it. Our system of democracy, our system of accountability depends on you stepping up, it depends on you using your voices, and it depends on, and it depends on you speaking up. So I'm excited to be here tonight to listen to you, to hear from you. This, I hope, is the beginning of a conversation. I tell folks all the time, I love my position because I get to engage with residents in the city of Boston every single day. The problem is we have over 70,000 residents that live in District 4, but only 7,000 or 8,000 come out to vote. Nearly 40,000 are eligible to vote. 30,000 are actually registered to vote, so all they have to do is just show up, but they don't. So we're out there every single day encouraging folks to share their stories so that we can work with them to pull them into, into the political system, but at the same time to inspire them to take action, to speak up. So thank you for allowing me to come and welcome you here to be a part of this. Continue to speak up. I can't wait to hear all the things you have to say tonight. And I apologize in advance if I have to cut out a little bit early, but I'm gonna stay as long as I can. I must say I had three different conflicts tonight, all involving politicos and fundraising, and I canceled them all because I wanted to come and hear from you. I believe in young people. I hired young people, including Sean over here, who's 19 years old. I believe in employing young people. I believe in listening to your voice, not from a distance, but right at my table. So thank you for being here. Thank you again, Gina. Thank you to the EMK Institute. And um, good luck tonight. some young people from the uh, Urban Science Academy, from Match Charter High School, from Westboro, from Lynn, um, and from Somerville High. Right, Andreen, is that where you go? No, where do you go? Cambridge, okay. Um, I think it's important that uh, before we get started, uh, we set a few like uh, norms of our culture. So when I, you hear something that you like, what do you do? Yes, yes. Um, exactly, you go, mmm, yes, that sounds great. Um, I think that one of the powerful things of spoken word is that it's a dialectic art form. So when we're up here performing, when the young people are up here performing, you can respond and also be a part and show how you are moved by what it is that they're saying. Um, I am originally from Chicago. I've been doing spoken word since I was a young person, and that is why I choose to do this work now. I think that it's not just my responsibility, um, but it's essential to uh, uh, changing the world that we exist in. 
I believe that art is connected to social action um, and that young people have the power to shape the world that we exist in. Um, so I'm gonna start by bringing up um, a young person who has been working with us for the past three, four, four years. Um, her name is Tope Shalola. Please give it up for Tope. Okay. Hi. Um, like, like she said, my name is Tope Shalola. I am 17 years old and I go to Kip Academy Lynn Collegiate. Blackbird, my baby sister craves flight. When I sit her in front of windows, she is silent. She is quiet. She is perched, mouth wide as if she could swallow sky, capture wind on the insides of her curled fists, arms spread, weightless, waiting for her wings to grow in. I am afraid she will fall in love with deceased dreams passed down for generations as hope. My baby sister laughs when I sing. Ayana Jones was shot in her sleep. I hold my sister as she snores. I have deceived myself into believing I can stop white supremacy with my bare hands, as if they aren't trying to kill me too. Sandra Bland spoke. I fear the day my sister's words become singed with black rage. When revolution trembles in her voice, Tanisha Anderson was slammed into the pavement. I don't trust sidewalks anymore. I know the pavement waits for her chalk outline too. Rakia Boyd was shot in Chicago. I inspect my sister's stomach for bullet casings. I don't question the day my fears become reality. Black children die, but my sister lives. And she is waiting for the day I stop clinging to her body every time a black body is disrespected in a courtroom. Every time a black woman ends up in a silent coffin, but you don't know my sister. You don't know of the mornings I wake up to her screaming. I wonder if she knows she may not make it home. I wonder if she knows this poem is my way of immortalizing her. I want her to be human before a movement. Her name is Tommy Laura Temi Tile Shalola. She is a manifestation of my mother's dreams. She is black joy in testimony all in one breath. She is 10 months. Her favorite food is applesauce. She giggles when I sing to her. She digs her fingernails into my bottom lip. When I laugh, she smiles, eyes wide. Hands smeared with the sweet potatoes mashed on her bib when she cries. Tears pooling at the seams of her church dress and my songs cannot assuage her tears. I cry too. I hold her as her voice becomes sirens. As she becomes too loud to breathe, too black to fly, she has no wings yet. I write her eulogy now. I'm writing my sister's eulogy before her first birthday. I'm trying to humanize a baby. I'm preparing myself to hold her dead body when they say she was asking for it that her existence was provocative, that black girls that yearn to fly to stretch their non-existent wings to the heavens have no business living. I'm preparing myself, yet she is still staring outside my bedroom window, oblivious of white America and misogyny as her palms peck at the glass, as her smile morphs into song. I know it is pointless, but I need you to know this. I need you to say her name with me. Tami Lore, Temi Tayo, Shalola. Thank you. All right, next up, we have a young person from U Urban Science Academy. Give it up for Amethyst Torres, and she shares my last name. <laughs> so my name is Amethyst Torres. I'm 17, and I'm with Urban Ego. White picket fence surrounding, 
white, white picket fence surrounding mother, father, three children, mom, dad, three siblings, mommy, daddy, three beautiful creations, a nation proclaiming dream, American dream, one of eight. Single unemployed mother fueling why I work so late. While I work, he forces sweat dripping down my hairline half the time but shivers rock my body in the coldest of nights. Nine, n n nine to five, working, nonstop working. I am yearning to feel the smooth surface of a white picket fence, only to receive the barbed wire coiled, sharp enough to pierce, blood, blood dark enough to set fear. This does not resemble a dream for me. American. I do not feel American in these moments. Somewhere maybe three or so layers under my appearance where Latina resides in me, comes out and dances among my skin. As I feel unwelcomed in the term American, while feathers tickle my outer being, being native to a land that is stolen from me, American dream is for the elite. My nightmares are rooted from the bottom of the feet of those who have tasted this dream. White picket fences are all I see. Standing in the projects, it feels the only white picket fence I get to keep is from the image across the street. Uh, so next up, we have two young people uh, from, I'm gonna ask both of y'all to come up, uh, from Match Charter. Um, and bef when they come up, I just want to give you a little background on what MassLeap does. So MassLeap stands for Massachusetts Literary Education and Performance. Um, and our idea is to help build a thriving youth, arts, and social justice community in Boston and the greater area across the state. Um, and how we do that is we have year-round programming um, for adults and professional developments, as well as we run the Louder Than a Bomb Youth Poetry Slam Festival um, and our new open mic, which I will ask one of the young people who's coming up to say a few words about because they're running it, um, is kicking off next week. Please give it up for the two young people from Match Charter. Woo! Woo! school. I'm, re I'm representing Boston Post Spoken Word. This poem is called The Cowards Versus Those Who Struggle. By the way, thank you so much, um, Mass Sleep, for giving me this opportunity. I never thought I would ever get this. Land of the free, home of the brave. But isn't that exaggerating? Is America lying to all those people, people who don't know, people from other places, for the American dream? for riches, for fame, for happiness, for promise, which are all lies. The lies they told my Somali parents that if they worked hard enough, they will, be able to, they will finally be able to get better careers. This country disrespects those who come here for the American dreams, who wish and work their lives off, wishing and wishing for the approval of citizenship and status, for the respect of a human being. But let me ask you this. Why do we lie? Why do we fight for the wrong causes and then die? Some of us who die for this country never get an apology from America for trying the American way, for wishing the American way, for wanting the American way, for believing in the American way, a way that only serves a specific type of American. Aren't we the land of the free and home of the brave, or are we the cowards who hide behind money, power, fame, and government? The ones who stop listening, the ones who stop caring while people are suffering, waiting for your attention. Hashtag arms up, don't shoot. Hashtag Terrence Crutcher. Hashtag Sandra Bland. Hashtag Tamir Rice and the countless hashtags unhashed, untagged, unnamed. Those suffering from poverty cannot afford university, can't put dedication, bleh, can't put dedication into better, bleh, sorry can't put dedication into better education, the worry becomes money, a language only some can master. My American dream is quite the opposite. 
is to provide for my family, to make my family proud, to succeed as a Somali American, use this education for elevation to get noticed in the shadow casted world, to leave a mark and a message that will surface through all of this despair. My American dream is to make my mother smile. But she has a different, she has a different dream altogether. She says, please, you are smart, use this for your advantage. Her dream speaks, be a doctor, be a lord. Symbols of typical American success. But I want my mother's dreams to say, good job, Tamea, with a big smile on her face. You did good. You survived this. I'm proud of you. Um, hi, my name is Nyleja Brown. I am 13 years old. I am from Hatch Middle School, and today I am representing Boston Pulse Youth Spoken Word. This poem is called The American Nightmare. And to start, I just want to also thank Sleep opportunity. A M E R I can is what I am, but I can't get that far in society. This red, white, and blue that I sing for, this red, white, and blue that I stand for, is now starting to turn brown, black. In America, there is crime every day. Red, white, and blue lights speeding down my urban streets, the younger me wonderizing what this all means, the older me realizing that the negatives are the norm. America doesn't reach for dreams, but nightmares. People come here looking for a place to make a change and live better, only to switch on the TV and see a wealthy white man preaching about how he's gonna build a wall to keep out illegal immigrants who try to escape the peril of their own country, who don't own themselves to this America. Citizenship comes at a steep price. Black men with their hands up, unarmed, getting overkilled because a white woman didn't know how to keep her finger off the trigger, off the implicit bias. We try to stand up, but we get shot down like it's an obstacle we cannot overcome. When the prices go up, the hopes go down. Trump might win, and now welcome to the great American nightmare. Sorry to burst your bubble, but what you thought America was is not at all what you were expecting. So many lives are lost, so many tears are being shed, so, many time, so much time spent fighting, then one day you realize you can't win this battle because the war has been rigged. Can't even sit outside on the porch anymore because you're scared you might get caught in the crossfire. Can't wear a hoodie without being looked at the wrong way. They're looking at all of us the wrong way. And now we all have the potential to be stopped and frisked at any given moment. Can't make mistakes, can't take risks, can't breathe. The police mistake the license to carry a gun to have the license to start taking lives. I ask when, when is my time? What can I hide behind? What, when can I wake up from this nightmare? I think it's terrifying that at our pres little, uh, presidential debate that stop and frisk was brought up as a legitimate uh, alternative. <laughs> um, thank you for those pieces. So we're gonna bring up a group piece. Does anyone know what a group piece is? No, no, nobody knows. Uh, so a group piece, so louder than a bomb, part of the festival is to bring young people together. So it isn't just about individuals sharing their individual stories, but it's about finding points of connection across difference to create a piece together, right? Um, so this first piece that we're gonna bring up, we're gonna bring Tope back up and Agnes. Please give it up for Tope and Agnes. Um, just to like clarify what the poem is about. Um, so we're doing a piece on solitary confinement and Agnes is going to be the person inside the prison, and I'm going to be the wall speaking at her. Just a bit. And it goes um, day by day or over a period of time.
Day one. I am my mother's daughter, a mesh of cells and promises she sold by her bedpost. My mother birthed me on the hottest day of August, under humid sun, blood, sweat, and prayer. I asked her if heaven was an endless birthday party. My mother laughed with wind chimes in her esophagus. I can't remember the notes. The quiet, quickly quarantines all that is left of her in my memories. But I know I am my mother's daughter. I birth dead babies here. My mother smells of black soap and plantain skins. Prison reeks of an industrialized orphanage. I will not die here. Isolation will make a hollow ghost out of your soul. My sadness will never become solitude. Day 60. I tried counting the days. You carve out my body. Inscribing tally marks with my fingernails until they bled. To keep count of how many days you've lied inside of me. I'm breathing. I know, I am my mother's, you made a mess of my mind. I don't remember the sun. Then how do you explain its burning? I can't feel the breeze. Then how do you explain its whisper? I dreamt of a woman last night. She spit out shattered wind chimes, grabbed onto melting candle wax until her flesh was singed. I don't remember what that means. You grasp onto what you can no longer hold. I don't know what it's like to be hold to be held by anything other than concrete. My pillow suffocates me in my sleep. The walls keep whispering my name. You won't listen. We steal your voice to save the silence. If you can hear me, then why can't you save me from myself? Day I 93. am my mother's daughter. Too often your kind invades your inside. I am my mother's inside. daughter. Heaven reap is an endless birthday party mother. No I am the same an endless birthday the party mother. So mother, long. heaven Humanity is endless mother. Humanity does not mother. exist outside there of concrete. Is no heaven. Leave human there is no heaven. Mother, mother. Like I am flesh. I am endless. Memories I am diminished within these my, cracks. My mother's daughter cool and ending. I am endless. I am. I'm Solitary confinement I am is my meant mother's to daughter I, ending mother. And you've just watched Heaven it take endless. another victim. I am endless. Um, that is the first time that I've heard that piece. Uh, very powerful. Um, I think I'm reminded of the ways in which prison um, and the incarceration of black and brown people in this country affects not just those people, but their families and their communities and their neighborhoods. Um, and I also, it makes me think that no matter what happens for this presidential debate, no matter who is the leader of our country, the power lies with the people who are organizing, and the power lies with us to ask and demand for change. Um, with that said, I want to bring up Rashim. Hi, my name is Rashim Mohammed. Um, I'm a part of the Urban Science Academy SLAM team. I'm 17 years old. Um, I think the title of my piece is named Cycle. They will tell me to shut my mouth, to close that window which lets my thoughts out, so what's happening now? Will they hold that door shut until they are sure that I have drowned, so what's happening now? Will my vocal cords be clipped so I can't shout, so what's happening now? Welcome to the year 2016. And I welcome you to the world's greatest magic mirror in which you were reflected to be free, where the heart is torn out of any being considered to be an anomaly, America. For the bloody fingerprints of black hands is imprinted in its history, pointing gun barrels at innocent children thinking their homes and streets are where the gangsters be. Leaving our communities to deteriorate into dens of paranoid beasts, or at least that's what the media depicts us to be. Where young children are left hungry rubbing blisters on their feet and walkers by won't hear their cries because their headphones are dominated by the loud sound of a beat. Like what's inside costs less than what's on your feet where someone's safety isn't guaranteed over a nice fresh clean pair of Air Force Nikes. Where the screams of the innocent can be heard more often than Kira Knightley tell me if you want to go home. And for many new, ooh, that's a pretty good song that I'm sure most of you don't know. But tell me if you want to go home. 
For if many knew what they would face once here, they would be gone faster than a bullet to the dome. Or like a call to your home and the IRS tells you that you have been foreclosed and now your assets are gone and so is everything else that you own. With a pop culture bites out of your personality like a portobello mushroom cheese steak and your identity is mixed to perfection to make a milkshake, making a full course meal in which anyone can partake, created from a recipe all too easy to replicate. Are these problems to be blamed on the government? With organization and execution that stinks worse than some rabbits, should there be a change in the establishment? Because I kind of see what's being established and I don't really like it. I th ethics and ideas that America was raised on when it was a teenager have been diluted like vodka mixed with ice water and now minority lives and justice are being discarded like childish emotions that America deems unnecessary for growth. Like it just brought out, broke out of an abusive relationship with freedom, which was once its crown jewel, inviting life into its walls as well as beauty. But freedom tended to drink a little too much at social gatherings and made an embarrassment of America in front of other countries. And freedom never learned from its mistakes. With its power and presence which overshadowed America's small figure, it used America's name to cover up its faults and damaged its ability to feel again. Like many of the lives lost in its process to heal again, where blood serves as a Ben and Jerry substitute and scenes of tragedy are binged watching an internal Netflix subscription. But every once in a while, every now and then, America and freedom begin again as friends. And the whole cycle begins again. So yeah, my name is Kingsley. Um, I'm repping Indigo Society Poets from Kip Academy Lynn. And uh, before I start my poem, I'd like to tell you, uh, talk about like all the problems occurring in Haiti, because there's like a hurricane happening right now, and there was an earthquake a couple years ago. And I feel like I can't pursue my American dream without knowing what's wrong with my country and like help and like without fixing my country. So my poem is called my poem is called 7.0 Magnitude. Bodies, hundreds of thousands of bodies lay motionless. Hundreds of thousands of blood-bathed bodies are spread across the floor. Decrepit, motionless Haitian bodies are just lying on the floor with the scent of post-revolution spread across the nation. The ghost of Toussaint Levinchere clings onto these bodies, trying to resurrect their freedom, but this time he cannot save them no one can save them. These bodies have been cemented into a forced predicament. The cracks on their skulls resemble the cracks on the floor. Their debris covered skin resemble the broken walls. Their red blood and blue tears resemble their own Haitian flag being wrinkled repeatedly into a shape of a ball that was thrown into the dust. This nation has turned into dust and these people has turned into dust and ashes and their debris has yet to be swept and they are just laying there. While people fail to realize how hard life can be post-slavery and post-revolution when you're only left with your pride but no resources to actually maintain it. These bodies are maintaining the stature of a broken down slave staring at the eyes of their non-apparent gun and then they hear screams. They hear bloody chants to God with tears blocking the flow of their plea and the taste of blood stained on the roofs of their mouths. They miss the roofs of their house. Abstract pain becomes concrete. The concrete is falling quickly onto their bodies and their bodies are slowly turning into memories. The last words they got the privilege to mumble was a plea to God, not a prayer, but a question. They asked them what they did. They asked them if the concrete piled on top of them was a replacement for shackles. They wanted to know why they were still trapped. They wanted to know if their lives were not enough. They wanted to know if slavery was not enough. They wanted to know. Were their bodies a replacement for the triumph slave gained once they grasped at their freedom? Were their bodies an advertisement for disaster? Or were their bodies just a twisted up symbol for a failed civilization? It was Haitians Independence Day when my mom asked me why we were eating the traditional soup jumu. She wanted to know if I was aware of the revolution in my meal, and I told her that I knew. 
I told her how Haitians were not allowed to enjoy this meal and how the masters wanted to scrape the taste of pleasure out of their tongues. And as I sat at my table, I pictured every victim of the tragedies in Haiti sitting down or smiling at the sight of food and triumph as if they finished off each battle in the swore of redemption, as if they can pick up their wrinkled Haitian flag and iron out all of the problems, as if these bloody bodies were soaked into the sweat of our past. And as I sip my soup six years later, reminiscing the day I came home seeing my mother's eyes filled with tears and hearing repeated phone calls to Haiti that were unanswered, I'm aware that I'm sharing with every victim of the tragedies in Haiti. I'm sharing with every blood-bathed body that, that left the stain of freedom on our flag. I'm sharing a piece of history to those who try to put our pain on pause. So remember, do not forget to breathe white Thank you for that piece, Kingsley. And that, I feel like that also is like, the, the, what's happening here is also a global issue, right? Like we are not in our own silo, we are connected, right? This is a country built on immigrants. Um, and I think my father came here when he was eight years old and was a construction worker his whole life. Um, and the American dream was not, he did not feel like that was for him. Um, also, I mean, did y'all hear that there are four countries that have issued warnings to folks coming into the US? Did y'all hear about that? Four nations have issued warnings. You know what I'm talking about, yep. Uh, to folks coming into the US, specifically if you are a black male. People are watching what is happening here. Word, I want to welcome up the incredible Michelle Garcia, please give it up. Hello, um, so my name is Michelle Garcia. I'm 17 years old. Um, I just very briefly wanted to talk about the open mic series that we're starting. Um, so I'm part of the Mass Sweeps. Mass Weaves, if you can feel it, you can speak it, Books of Hope in House Slam's um, internship program. And so basically it's a collection of teens around the Bay, from around the Bay Area, I mean Boston area, um, <laughs> gathered together to like start workshops and start o an open mic series just because we really want to build a community of youth writers. And so our first open mic series is going to be next Tuesday at 6 o'clock. Makeshift Boston, find me later for more details. Uh, so the mic is youth only, but everybody's welcome to come and watch and we invite you all to come. And Andrine and Kofi, who are also here and also gonna be performing, if they wanted to add anything, they should. So um, the piece I'm gonna be doing is a brand new piece that I just created um, about my mom. So it's called my bougie mom piece. And for those who don't know what, like, bougie means, it usually means somebody who thinks, like, they're, like, it's kind of, like, stuck up and, like, arrogant. And I think that there's something to be said about the way we classify women of color in our country and how the media portrays women of color. And, like, just with everything being Hispanic and all these immigration laws, I've been really going through it. So I'm going to... My mom be bougie, her nails stay did, ain't never been afraid to throw down like you can catch these hands too. My mom's palms met God on a Sunday, have seen him let his guard down and fed him prayer. She's seen her mother's hands pick rice until her hands bled opportunity. My mother has never been afraid to get her hands dirty, never cared if her nails chipped, but she will always get, her, always get them done again. My mother's walk will let you know it's happening, will make you think that she first learned the quick two-step of bachata, like the cement is her dance floor, like the pavement isn't trying to get her to. My mother's always swinging her hips. 
Her figure knows why be an hourglass when you can be a glass of wine. My mother drinks white wine at the dinner table. No Chardonnay tears don't stain. My mother drapes me in champagne silhouettes. We don't throw clothes away in this house. We pass down our hand-me-downs. My mother, fold, my mother makes mutiny mandatory in every meal she makes. She folds up genocide in her napkin and shoves it in her purse. My mother makes her survival a stuck-up protest. Like she don't care if you gonna call the cops. Like she's still gonna hit her kids. Like my brother still got shot. Like she's still trying to mend my heart. My mother will pretend like she's not hurting. Like she doesn't cringe at the headlines. Like she doesn't think I'm next. My mother's attitude is unapolog unapologetically bougie. Will not excuse itself from the table. Will not go eat in the kitchen. Will not thank you for calling it articulate. It will let you know what it's like to be a woman in this country. How we don't inherit survival. How we carry our attitude in our carry-ons. So my mother stay bougie, her nails stay did. She still ain't afraid to throw down, and she still stays woman. Thank you. Letter to Brock Turner. Stanford greatness. There is something about you that is familiar. I've seen the way your privilege takes slaps. White boy with golden hair. Promised the full ride to an Ivy League. Promised Olympic gold for your speed. Promised the whole world. So of course, you be women belong to you too. I heard you were good with water. With women, I heard you think they were the same thing. You said her hands beckoned you like Corey. They brought you in like tidal waves. You said you were drunk, but don't you know how to swim? Aren't you a shark? Isn't that why you have an appetite for our blood? Isn't that why they prosecute the survivor, not the predator? Because all men hold the triton, all women are bait. Aren't you used to this? Diving in head first. Not having to think twice? Isn't this your instinct? Your inheritance? A family heirloom passed down for generations? A legacy of wealth white men built? That keeps them safe? That keeps them free? Did you know it can take a woman her whole life to fall in love with her body? And you made her want to remove her like in like a wetsuit? To crawl out of the only place that screamed home? Do you know what it's like to drown? To have your voice diluted. To be reduced to a puddle. To, to be, be turned into a droplet. To tears. I hope you drown in her sobs. I hope you choke on her salt. I hope karma swallows you like a tsunami. What? I thought you could scream underwater. We just have about four or so more pieces for you. Uh, please put your hands together for Kofi. Hi, I'm Kofi Dodzi. I'm 17 years old and I'm a senior at Westboro High School. And this poem is titled Nightstick. I just want to kind of lay down the groundwork for the poem because it sometimes seems kind of hard to follow. So it's, point of view, it's the point of view of police brutality from the point of view of, of Baton. Yeah. I orchestrate brutality, but I never wanted to compose this symphony. We Batons fell into the role masterfully, though as blue Beethovens adorned in badges used us to keep the beat on black notes. It's just that the syncopation of their screams is always the hardest to hear. As it ends and repeats, 
Voices crescendo in agony as we direct the masterpiece. We helped create a piece once. We titled him Rodney. Reduced his minute, his, reduced his life to eight minutes of mutilation, but that song got old real quick. So we found new symphony halls, wherever bars kept black notes in place. It's hard to be a conductor for this symphony, especially when they twirl you like color guard on parade, eager and willing to direct the next tune. See, we batons, the color of midnight, turn black bodies into battered heaps. Now ain't that black on black crime? Are we just an officer's token black friend? Would he put us down the minute we look threatening too? We do our best to quell the rhythm of rebellion. We put rests on the voices of colored women so we can play the same tired tune over and over again. They never seem to get a solo. Only seen as a supplement to a black man's medley, the audience doesn't seem to like this piece anymore. America doesn't seem to like peace anymore. Black folk never wanted to be in admittance hell. They never even bought tickets, but they've been instrumental in this creation. Unplugged from society, all we wanted to do was make music. We never expected the dissonance of black instruments to create the best melody, yet keeping time on torture was something of a classical arrangement for us. Like leaving bodies to hang in the breeze like high notes. Like massacre is musical. So not for nothing, we have masterminded the murder of a people, have masterminded the maiming of a people because he who holds my hand or wishes I were a whip, misses the sound of its crack and decided to make music instead. But who am I to judge when I am cut from the same wood that decorates that whip's handle? We are tired of making songs out of suffering, of turning the altercations between my maestro and black folk into twisted duets. Remove me from his hand before the body count rises like chord progression. We pray that this sees a finale soon, but for now, the show must go on. America always wants an encore. When I say we are, y'all say powerful. We are? Powerful. We are? Powerful. When I say we want, y'all say peace. We want peace. We want peace. We are powerful. We want peace. Y'all are beautiful. Please give it up for Andrine. Hi. <laughs> I'm part of the youth internship that the wonderful Michelle was talking about. Um, so, I mean, everything that she said was right. Um, this is like the first year that this is happening. Um, it's called the Third Eye Mic Experience. Um, we woke, we spoke, you know, this is all thanks, real good. Um, but we worked really hard and it would be really amazing. Um, it's from six to eight, yes, six to eight, um, cause we also wanna watch out for the youth and getting home and everything. Um, so yes, please enjoy this piece that I wrote on my mother, on her being an immigrant here um, from Haiti. Um, yeah. The idea of America rocked my mother every night, wrapped her warm in stories of better house and jobs and husbands who know how to treat a woman, know to make her feel a privilege, to let her raise their kids and still teach a classroom, America bought her a plane ticket. She thought for love or for freedom or not. America met her at the gate, told her she'd need to burn everything in her bag. America made himself husband and stayed with her forever. This is not me telling her story. This is me repeating Sunday nights on the right side of our wooden table. She smiles at all the memories, even the bad ones, even of the stories you left her with, cause then she remembers her bed and when she was little, she dreamt of lessons she'd teach, how she imagined of taking them overseas, coming home with gifts with, for her family. But America don't like her none, but still won't let her go. He'd rather give her the permission to work only when he wants to give her shift. And what does a nine-year-old girl do when her mother has to work on her birthday? She sucks it up. Cause being the only of her mother's kids, only of her mother's kids to live with her comes with responsibilities. 
to be okay with everything, to be good at everything, to hold your mother after a funeral because you're the only one that knows how hard she can fall, to stop crying because at least you've held your mother, to stop crying because at least America gave her a job, even if he's boxed up all her dreams and sent them back home. The only time my mother smiles is when she talks about home, not the one America gave her, the one where she, the one where her bed still stands, where her pillow is stained with child and dreams or things that have died. A part of my mother has died, but the body inside jumps a little every time she tells a story. America gets a little scared every time she remembers a story. America, listen to me, wake the dead and speak life into my mother's story. Keep that applause going for Dubam. Hi, hi, I'm Dubam. How do I, this is like new technology. Um, correct, I just, oh. Um, so, hi, I'm Dubam. Uh, I'm from, I'm, seven, I'm 17, from Urban Science Academy. I'm not sure if I should wear a hat in here, so I'm just gonna wear it like this. <clears throat> My teacher tells me it's a mistake to say that the three-fifths compromise means that a black man counts for three-fifths of a white man. What the compromise really means is letting people turn their tool for divided labor into a human real quick. Compare today. Now these tools come in all shapes, tones, and sizes, and they become human for like an eternity, no longer object, objectively, this is no longer a compromise. More war-torn understanding, more handshake with hidden cross of fingers. This is contested, yet agreed, but something's left unsettled. It's pretty hard to change a mindset. Apparently, we still haven't changed one. Hard work gets you the success you want to achieve, the American dream. But there's a little loophole in this dream, a little life hack that makes this dream turn nightmare, get people to do all the work, hard work for you and don't give them any terms of thanks. However, this strategy seems to be overused, become corporate theory, become upper class stratagem, make dollars out of diamonds in the rough. I am diamond adamant about goals, gold to make life golden, gold to keep family tight. I'm trying to achieve. We need to breathe. We diamond, diamond, but not crown jewel, believe me. Don't doubt me because I'm not an A-list. Because lack of reparations to compromise, to lose who I am is something that I don't want to witness. All right, we have one more performer and then a final group piece. I want you to give it up as loud as you possibly can for Agnes. Magnus and um, I wrote this poem when I was thinking about like what it means to be a woman in like my culture and how um, just like women of color from other cultures don't aren't um, included in like when like when we talk about feminism there's so much empowerment for like more like like white feminists instead of women of color feminists I mean women of color women wait no I'm sorry I'll just I'll just get to it <laughs> A 12-year-old girl from my village was sold by her parents to a man three times her age. A nine-year-old Cameroonian girl had her breast ironed to make her less desirable to men. A six-year-old Sudanese girl died after severe genital mutilation. Girls from countries like mine know too well the price of womanhood is pain. If blood does not constantly trickle down your thigh, you are still a child, girls like me are too accustomed to changing ourselves to achieve a culture's definition of woman. And it's not just Africans. South Asian women are slowly being exterminated, but I cannot speak for them, so I ask, 
Dear Pakistani woman, did your husband ask you if the kerosene they doused you with matched the scent of your perfume? Did your eyes glimmer like the flame before he threw it at you? Did those flames dance around your body so elegantly you forgot your skin was on fire? Was your death the ultimate dowry? Dear Bangladeshi woman, when your spouse told you he wanted to change the way you looked, did you know acid was the best beauty technique? Did sulfuric acid kiss your face better than your husband could? Could you feel your bones corrode under your flesh? What did you do to deserve that? Dear 12-year-old girl from my village, do you remember my name? Does your husband still beat you? You became, a wife before, you became a wife before a woman and you still don't know what that means yet. There is no sugarcoating domestic abuse. How in my country it's synonymous with the transition of womanhood. But our screams are drowned out by those of white feminists. Our hashtags lead to make room for hashtag free bleed and free the nipple. Just because there's no translation for feminism in these countries doesn't mean our problems don't deserve recognition. Don't tell me I am trying to separate the movement. The movement was separated before it began. Don't tell me I am trying to start a war. What could our wars when half your soldiers are already dead? This poem was created from the ashes of women America doesn't care about. It was developed in misogynistic villages. It was created for that 12-year-old girl in my village. This poem was not created for your feminism. We do not need your feminism. We will not wait for an invite to your protest while our girls are dying because the most feminist thing there will ever be is the silent screams of dead women. Okay, um, our poem is about um, a, a Yoruba goddess named Oya. She is goddess of wind, and this is a letter from her to white colonists. <clears throat> Take me, Oya. Take me, Oya. Take me. Oh, yeah. Yoruba goddess from Nigeria responds to Take white colonists. Abum Oya is in wine. Ali Oya, Ayabati G. I am Oya. Orisha, goddess of war, goddess of storms. My name means she tore. What makes you think I will rip up the ash beneath your feet? I've watched my children get torn apart for far too long. Watch their bodies plucked off African trees to satisfy your hunger. You, Gunwa, white man, Oye Igbo, have the audacity to colonize my children. You feed off the flesh in my daughters and laugh at her blood between your legs. You have trampled on African soil too many times, have bent their spines to worship your face, have used parts of the ribcage to support your plantations. You have killed my children. They have left their bodies to hang in my winds. How dare you leave their corpses on my doorsteps, you? Tio, white man, Fufu Okurun. How documented how many of my children have drowned in the Atlantic? How calculated how many of their bones have washed up on my soil? Have estimated how long it took for my prayers to evaporate from their tongues. They don't recognize their own mother. They don't hear me weep in my winds. I attempt to piece back together their dismembered bodies in my hurricanes. My destruction is how I cope. Now I am myth. I am Juju, a cursed goddess of the wind. But who does the white man pray to? Your Jesus is the bastard black son of white supremacy, always powdering his nose and lynching himself to resemble your perfect porcelain complexion. Do your gods force foreign soil to cough up the blood of its people? Do your gods share for black bodies too? Do you know who I am? I am Oya, Orisha, goddess of war. I scoop broken bodies with my bare hands. I cleanse their corpses in my waves. I turn their bodies into my uterus for rebirth. My children, now caskets filled with broken languages and misplaced cultures. 
hold the rosary in one hand and a crucifix in the other. You don't remember how to pray to me. You have cast my children with amnesia. How dare you whitewash all the God within them? I will show you why they call me Queen of Temptis. I'll devour you like tsunamis. I'll burn your missionary prayers back into their throats. I'll build new altars from your skeletons. I'll cut open my veins and put my wrath into your lungs. I could have crushed your slave ships on the shores of Abekuta. I could have smashed your skulls in before you deemed this holy land Nigeria. I could have drowned your children. But I am a god. Take me, oh yeah. Take me, oh yeah. Take me, oh yeah. Take me, oh yeah. If everyone who performed wants to come up and sit on the stage and join me, yeah. Give it up one more time for all the performers. short Q&A session. I have a couple questions that I want to ask and then I want to open it up to everyone here. Um, I also want to say to, I feel like I should be facing y'all. I also want to say uh, thank you to everyone who performed. Y'all were amazing. Um, and don't feel like you, every single one of you, if you're not pulled to, has to answer every question. I would just say answer the questions that you feel like you're pulled to. And the same kind of norms that we talk about in terms of like thinking about um, how much you're speaking or how little you're speaking, like make sure that you step forward or step back. Does that make sense? Cool. Uh, so first I just wanted to ask why did you start writing? Head to Ben. Get up. No, no. Okay. Hey. Okay. Um, I started like writing writing poetry, right? Um, so I started writing because I was in school, and uh, in school they have a poetry curriculum in the writing, um, and they said to write a poem, and I said, okay, and that's how it started. Okay. Anyone else? And Dreen, and then our Alicia. Um, I started writing because instead of getting extra loud and expressing myself in all the wrong ways, I got a notebook pen and made it happen. And I was doing this for years. And then I came to Match, and my wonderful poetry coach, Tony De La Rosa, he started this Boston Post Club, and it really got me into getting my voice out there. <laughs> um, let me hand this mic back. Sure. I can't reach it. Um, I like started poetry in like probably the worst times in my life. Um, and like I, 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 I didn't even really think of poetry before then. Um. I didn't speak much at all even. I barely spoke during the day. And um, I had a teacher at my school who had a club and she, it was for high schoolers. And I was in like fifth grade or sixth grade. And um, she invited me to the high school to come and write with like 11 and 12th graders. And I watched them and I wrote with them and I started um, using a file cabinet, and now I have a whole file cabinet of my work at home, just poems. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, about that. Um, yeah, I have a book um, called Even Pairs Speak to Me. Um, it just came out this month. Uh, it, I did it through Books of Hope. 
Um, and it was, I mean, it was fun. It was definitely, it was, like, I definitely got a lot more support on it. Um, I, I'm i almost sold out out of the 100 copies that I had had before. So, I'm, you know, I'm you know, feeling good, like, you know. So, yeah. And, you know, I got in, like, two libraries, so that's good. And, uh, you know, I think Andrew Ooh. might have a couple copies here, you know, just saying. Uh, Kofi? Because of, like, a program that came to my school through Mass Sleep. So, Alex. Where is Alex? He's here somewhere. But anyway, Alex came to my school and did a week-long workshop when I was in eighth grade. And they started with a poetry slam. And he comes through like, my name's Alex, and I like to get loud in libraries. And I was kind of like, what? Like, what? And then... I had been writing music beforehand, and up until then, I had never really thought of poetry as anything more than that stuff like Robert Frost writes and puts in poetry units for me to read and silently dislike, but that's just me. And then I kind of just kept writing, and Alex really did support me in that. And then I came to the high school, and around spring, louder than a bomb time had come around, and my, team, my school's team needed a fourth member, and they pulled me on, and I've been writing and performing ever since. Um, so to follow up with that question, do you think or do you all think that writing um, is connected to social change or not and why? Let's go with. So for me, it's like it helped a lot because <clears throat> it helped a lot because I was like that one kid who sat in the back of class and did not like to raise her hand. But at lunchtime, I was up and ready, and I was talking with everyone. Even if they didn't want to listen to me, they would have to listen to me because I was the loudest skin in class. So too bad for them. Sorry for right now. But sorry, not sorry. But it, like, helped me because I like writing, and I like music a lot. And poetry really, like, helps me with that. Like, I don't have to, like, yell it out. I can just write it on paper. Mm -hmm. And it helps me with social issues because, like, I can talk more to people now. Like before, I was really shy to talk to people, and now I'm just like up and ready. To talk to everybody. Come to me. We're gonna have a conversation for three days. Get ready. I'm just warning y'all right now. Mm -hmm. Right. Great. Kingsley. So, <clears throat> sorry. So I think that writing really has a big part. Like it really, like social change really has to do with writing because I feel like with the youth today, a lot of people don't have like a lot of people do have a voice, but they don't have a way to express their voice. And I feel like writing allows us to express our voice in our art form. So like having like these different open mics and like having like these different performances, it's, it's allow, it allows us to like, you know, speak about the things that we really, that we're really passionate about. And social change is something that all of us are really passionate about. So I feel like writing and like performing is a gateway to like, to like, you know, show like what you believe in. So, yeah. And also I like, started writing because it was kind of weird. I, I started writing by, by listening to J. Cole, like his songs, his old songs where he would just talk about like deep things and I tried to like emulate his style. So I started like rapping. But then in ninth grade, we had this uh, poetry club and all three of us were in it, me, Tope, and Michelle. And I don't know, like ever since then, ever since we got introduced to Louder Than a Bomb, like we just started to like enjoy writing even more and like enjoy performing. So, you know, I think louder than a bomb, and I think J. Cole, if you're out there, <laughs> I, th <laughs> I thank them for you know helping me out with this. So, um, so I feel like like one important thing that I always think about is like where would we be without Baldwin or Angelou or Achebe? Like these are the writers that have like have been the fuel to social change, like even today. And so it's like, the thing is nobody really, unless you're like in a position of power, most people don't care about what you have to say. And performing and writing gives you, gives you a way to say exactly what you wanna say in a way that will make people listen to you. And I feel like that's something that, um, I think before, before I was a performer, before I was a writer, I struggled to actually get my opinions out there just because I was shy and I felt like I wasn't, what I was saying wasn't valid. And I feel like poetry and writing has given me 
a level of self-validation and makes me feel like when you're in a writing community, it makes you feel less alone because you know there's people out there that are not only going to validate you, but empathize with you and tell you like, you know, I can't, I don't know what that is to go through that, but I feel you and I'm here for you and we stand in solidarity and that's where social change happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's... <coughs> Uh, Tope, do you want to say something real quick? Oh, you were just... Um, like, as far as poetry goes and um, promoting social change, I remember later, like earlier on this year, when we did our group poem at LTAB, it was about our school and a lot of the things that we saw. And um, we were talking about like a bunch of things, like how the roofs were falling down and like the environment, like the general environment of being in the school. and. Um, as far as poetry goes, poetry has a lot of power to like communicate something. Because when you're performing something, you're standing on a stage in front of a bunch of people and you're saying something. Like a lot of times I like I believe like poetry is saying something to yourself, but like when we're actually doing it for a cause, we're saying it to other people. And it's like the audience is now like intended for something more than ourselves. And um our group poem was it was like directed at BPS because we wanted change. We were tired in the school environment that we were staying in, and that, we, that actually had some type of effect because we were able to make contact with Boston Public Schools, and um, we were able to talk with them about the things going on in our school, and we're actually working with them right now um, to see if some of those things can change. So as far as poetry having the power to actually make change, I believe that is very true, because in, more than a performance art is a way of communication, because if you do poetry and you have a message to put out there that is meant for other people other than yourself and people take the time to listen, then it's, it's like, like you said, it was like a, a form of dialect almost. It was almost like we were speaking for the audience we were intended to uh, perform for, I guess. So yeah, it pronounced change like super. In terms of poetry being a form of social change, I like to think a lot about, um, as Michelle said, James Baldwin, and I also think of um, Nina Simone. So the poem that I wrote, Blackbird, about my little sister was based off of Nina Simone's song, Blackbird, and to think about how black women in society are, especially in terms of police brutality, are not spoken about, and black women being the most disrespected people in America, um, and how everybody wants black woman features, but no one wants to actually be a black woman. Um, it's something that I think about so much in my writing. And I feel like before I started writing like poetry, I had all these emotions about being darker, about um, having um, sisters who I see were bullied about their hair, who um, I'm Nigerian American. So it's like when they saw like our, our like rice or when they saw our food, we were like, oh, what's that? But then now you see being um, West African being a trend and everybody wants to wear dashikis. And it's like, um, I had all these feelings and I feel like when I started writing, I was just like, oh, it, it's not just me. Like there are other women who look just like me who are going through the same thing. And when I speak, when I say Sandra Bland, when I say Ayana Jones, when I say, um, when I say these names, when I say Rakia Boyd, I am bringing these women the attention they need because a lot of times black women who are shot are forgotten about. And I think that one of Nina Simone's most important quotes that I remember is that as an artist, you need to reflect the times that you live in. And all of my poetry, I try to reflect what it's like to be a black woman in the 21st century, to live, um, you know, to see a black president, but also to see a man like Donald Trump run for presidency and see how much fame he's getting for it. Um, so I think writing is so much about social change. And in order to be an effective artist, you need to reflect the times that you live in in order to speak for your generation, but in order to show um, the rest of the world like what it is to be a black woman. So I just have one or two more questions. Um, and I want to go to the piece about the election that's coming up. Um, and I just wanted to ask y'all if you had one thing that you could tell folks who are able to vote right now, 
What is one thing that you would say to them or ask them? <laughs> um, Alicia? Can you continue talking? This is one topic I feel very strongly about. Okay, so Donald Trump. Um, he is supporting stop and frisk. And you people who are able to vote want to vote for him, and he's going to stop us. And he wants to stop us, and he wants to frisk us. What if we're innocent? It's like, you, you're talking about trying to make America great again, and with this man, you're not making it great again. You're just making it worse. So one thing I would say to people who want to vote is please be smart, use common sense, make the right decision. Do not vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> please don't, because it's not making America great again. What are you trying to accomplish voting for a man who doesn't care about people that are not like him? All he cares about is money, giving people power who already have power. But what about the people who don't have a lot of power? What are you going to do with them? You're just going to help the people who don't need help and leave the people who do on the streets. I don't understand. How is that making America great again? It don't make no sense. Um, like what she said, Donald Trump is not really helping anyone here or anything like that. And if you're going to vote, please choose wisely. Please choose wisely because you don't know who you're voting for because everyone, no matter what they say, they could be lying to you. They could be like putting up for election and they could be saying things that they will never do. They're like, oh, I will help you with this. I'll make more jobs happen. I'll do this. I'll do this. But they're all, you don't know what they're going to do because that's what they're going to do. That's what they say, and you can't always trust what people say. And with Donald Trump, like, why would you really vote for him? You heard what he says. You know that he says idiotic things, and no matter what he says, I think people are usually voting for him because they think it's funny, um, but it's honestly not funny. Like, he wants to build a wall, but really, how are you going to build a wall? How are you going to try to kick all the Mexicans out? You can't kick all the Mexicans If you want to kick the Mexicans out, kick the Mexican states out so you you all gonna lose out that, that you're gonna lose those too. And you wanna kick all the people who are immigrants out. They helped you build this country. Like in Native Americans, you wanna kick them out too? Who's the one who found this country first? It's not you, it's not Columbus, it's not any of those people who decided to find America. It was people who came here first on foot, not by boat. They came here on foot, they were here first. Um, I'm just going to plug my poem real quick. Uh, so I wrote a poem recently about um, the debate between Hillary and Trump, and I, I compared their, their campaign plans to pairs of pants. Now, um, I, used to be, I used to be, you know, the guy that says, you know, Trump, why would you vote for him? But I've learned that, you know, I don't really know, like, what he's saying. Like, it, it, it might be not even true, and sometimes... What Clinton says might not even be true. So I think it's really, it's up to what you believe in. Um, if you want to vote for Trump, I mean, go ahead. I, I, I've, I've seen some good things that he said. It was really small, but I saw like one. Um, I saw some bad things that Clinton said. It was, it was more than one. Um, I think you should also keep an eye for uh, the vice presidents too, because I don't know anything about them. I um, think one of the biggest things during this election is that people just don't want to vote but are eligible to vote. And if um, I could say something to eligible voters, I would say, please vote. Um, vote for me. Vote for the young men and women that attend my schools who aren't eligible to vote yet. Vote for the kids walking around your neighborhood who will be affected by this vote later on. You know, think about us. I know that it's going to be difficult this year because we're not really given such great choices. But just choose wisely because know that your choice is going to affect someone else. The 
Just voting on the big scale, like the presidential election, but voting in your local elections and voting in smaller elections too, it's really important because the fact of the matter is, even though the president is, in terms of the executive branch, is supposed to be enforcing the Constitution or whatever, it, what happens in your state isn't necessarily, like in your towns and your communities, aren't necessarily always at the forefront of what's being talked about in the national, like, national spotlight. Another thing, just don't feel ignorant with your voting. Make sure you're doing your research. You don't go in blindly because you maybe agree with one or two things. You need to understand everything before you go forth and put in, put all your chips on one, one man or one woman or one elected official or anybody, really. You just have to go forth and understand and comprehend everything that's going on before you go forth and just, because that's the thing, a vote is powerful. The number of, vo the number of votes that each, that each person gives, is, it's one, but that, that, that one vote holds. Tremendous merit. Just have to use it wisely. Great. All right. Well, I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, there's lovely person right here with the mic, and a person right there with the mic. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask this incredible panel of young people who I just want to listen to all day on repeat. that last group poem that you read because that was like one of the most powerful group poems I've ever seen and I was curious about your process. Um, so we, so Portia is our, our coach for Brave New Voices and Portia is a very dedicated woman who <laughs> forces us to, to work very, very hard. Um, and we basically had practice like on a daily basis. And we were just thinking about ancestry and how we want to bring in our West African like forefront because the team predominantly was like, uh, it's me, Agnes, Chinma, who's not here, and Kofi are all West African and Michelle's Dominican. So it was like, <laughs> we're, yes, she rep PR for us. and we were thinking about just bringing in um, our heritage. And it took us about a couple practices to write it, um, but it was a fusion of what I was thinking when I was thinking about Oya and what Agnes was thinking. And it took a lot of like research of like asking our parents, like, who is Oya? Like, what is it? Because we're both Yoruba, we come from the same tribe. So we asked our parents, uh, oh, you're Igbo. Sorry, <laughs> I'm Yoruba, she's Igbo, so we come from tribes, where, I mean, we're still Nigerian, so that's, <laughs> okay, we're all Nigerian, that's basically, um, but, oh, I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot, um, but yeah, um, the blocking, though, took a little while to get everything done, and the singing came from, like, um, other songs that we were inspired by, um, Agnes once had some. Um, I think I wanted to write a poem that was just like, had um, both of our um, cultures in it, and also how many um, goddess poems are there? How many spiritual poems do you see? And having a spiritual poem that talks about a topic that like may have happened like years of, ago that still impacts like the lives of the people who live in, um, uh, countries that were colonized. I think that the way that we talk about the topic of colonization in just like a unique spiritual way, I don't think anyone's ever done that before and we're proud to be the first people to do that. Um, my, uh, my question is for uh, Kofi. Um, I wanted to know uh, your process and also the inspiration for your poem. So when I was creating the nightstick piece, I was really, I had written like my first persona piece where I'm embodying, embodying an object or a person that isn't me. And I kind of fell in love with that idea. And what's real, and something that even Amanda said to me when I was looking to write a new piece was, what kind of, uh, what kind of things never really get a voice? And you hear about police brutality all the time, and you see it in poetry very frequently, but you see it from similar points of views, whether it's like somebody watch, that's seeing it happen, or it's kind of, or just telling the story of something that's happened, but you never really hear about the instrument. 
and something that Portia, our coach that works us incredibly hard and gives us all this inf influence and inspiration, was talking about, has this whole mantra about not using the master's tools. And in a society that has a police force that uses brutality to try to like discipline its citizens, that doesn't make sense to me. So I wanted to hear something from the point of view of the object that's been made to do this. Um, I know you guys were already talking about Trump and how you feel about him. But more specifically, how do you feel about like the Black, Black Lives Matter movement and what he thinks about it? Okay. So I think he doesn't really care about the Black Lives Matter movement because he's like very egotistical. He's really, I think, running for the election for power for money and for being more like famous and I don't think I think he will only like lie to the people by saying he cares about the Black Lives Matter movement but he he honestly does it as what he shows to us um so I feel like there's a lot to be said not only about Trump but also about the portrayal of the media and the people who are behind the media as well who are in similar positions as Trump who are wealthy men who have privilege. And so I feel like a lot of times the media makes the, the way that they portray the Black Lives Matter movement is to be this like violent movement that's very malicious and out here to like say that one race is better than the other when that's really not the case. And I feel like, so like a lot of times in these protests, they'll show They'll show lootings and then they'll show like all this violence, but then they fail to show the peaceful protest that's going on or the six peaceful protests that are going on. And like they're not even a lot of times they're making it seem like, well, these people look at what these people are doing. And it's like, what? Like, do you know how much do you even understand? Like a lot of the people making this commentary aren't people who are people in positions of privilege who don't have to deal with this constant fear every single day. And like even there's something to even say with the like all lives matter movement. It's like nobody was saying all lives matter until people were saying black lives matter. And you know why that is? It's because people are always trying to discredit the black community and everything that they stand for because that's what it is. Why? It's not that all lives don't matter. Obviously, every individual life as people matter, but that's not what we're talking about right now. That's not what's important right now. And I feel like Trump is in the position where he, he has the power to do something. He has something that a lot of us don't have, which is privilege and a whole lot of money. And think about what it is that he's actually doing with that. And how he's using his power and his voice to portray all these low-level communities that aren't getting the same benefits that he is. So, um, now I don't do a lot of uh, very in-depth research about Trump. I've seen him say one comment about the Black Lives Matter movement, which is that we are divisive. Now, when I heard this, I was upset, but I think, but now I know the reason why, like, I feel it's because he's like not well researched either. I feel like he's just the view, kind of like what Michelle said, he's like the view of the people who see the, the bad parts, just the looting and just the violence of it and not go deep in to see, you know, what we're really all about. And because of that, uh, he has that opinion and because he has this public face that just like ruins him even more. Um, what was your question again? Because that's just what I was thinking in my head. What was your question again? How, how you feel about what, what he's saying about, black, about the Black Lives Matter movement. Oh, okay. So before I was mad about it, but now I'm like, maybe you should like Google it. Um. I agree with Miss uh, what Michelle said. Um, I was on Facebook one day and I saw this post and it said, 
we it said Black Lives Matter with about it was like it was about the All Lives Matter thing. It says we said Black Lives Matter, not only Black Lives Matter, which means we didn't say that Black lives are the only lives that matter. When you say that Black lives matter, we mean that we matter more. But well, you don't matter more, but we matter just as much as everybody else does. We're not meaning to say that we matter more than other people. We just want to be represented because we're not being represented in, like much well, like because like to the point where it becomes regular to see a black man getting shot down in the news, that's just something disgusting. I'm at the point when I'm not surprised at it anymore and that's something that needs to change. Um, but as far as Donald Trump and what he thinks of the Black Lives Matter movement, I don't, I don't think he's prejudiced against black people. I think he has his own prejudices. I don't think he's racist is what I meant to say. He probably has his own prejudices. I don't know the man personally and I frankly don't care, but basically, I just think that he wants to use it as a tool to get him into the election. If he want, he just wants to say what people want to hear in that regards to that topic. Just like um, like a hostile takeover, everybody's going to eat uh, icy pops. All right, if I want people to like me, I'm gonna buy icy pops and I'm gonna bring it over to my side so people come running over to me. That's the only that, that's how I think he sees it. I think he sees it as like a business thing, because if he really because that, like, from, like, the presidential, like, from the presidential debate, nobody really, like, nobody elaborated on the topic. Hillary kind of just, like, scratched the sur surface. But, like, yeah. Yeah, black people rule. Well, like, um, yeah, Donald Trump didn't really touch upon it. I just really think he wants to use it as, like, a tactic to flock people over him. But, the, but what just ended it for me is when he said the stop and frisk thing was a good thing. Well, it really wasn't. Um... But like how I feel about it, I don't. I don't really. I don't really think that either of them are particularly advantageous for us. I think we're still going to be where we are. I don't really think it's on anybody's head, especially those two. I don't think it's on any either, either of them heads, either of their heads, to promote advance for us. I think we have to do it on our own, and that's a lot of the things. Like that's like a lot of things in this world. You have to end up doing it on your own. So if we want to make change for ourselves, we're going to have to do it ourselves. So um, as far as what Donald Trump thinks, I don't really think that is uh, something we should be worried about. Um, I think that this all ties back to down to like all the stereotypes that black people and African Americans have faced throughout all the years. Like what you, if you walk into our, one of our neighborhoods, what you what you think you see is a bad neighborhood and everybody there's crime everywhere and people are dying and there's just fights and drugs and that's like that's not every neighborhood though you can't you just can't think about us like that tying it back to Donald Trump I think that like you said it's not the first thing that he really thinks about he has he has he has his trump tower he has all this money he has all this privilege and you think that we're going to be the first thing that he's thinking about right now obviously not so i feel like like he said if we want to do something about it we have to make the change because it's our black lives that do matter and i feel like him as president what is what is he going to really do for our lives Nothing he can really do because he he has not witnessed the struggle at all, not at all. He can't even say he can't even connect. He he doesn't know. He don't know. So if we want, like, and all lives do matter, but if we want to change, it's like if we want to change what's going on, we have to take this stand. We have to change. It's not just gonna come to us. We have to get it. It. I'm done. Oh. All right, uh, please give it up one more time loud for these incredible young people. Uh, Hi, I'm Sarah Yezzi. I'm in the education department here at the Institute, and I just want to thank um, you, uh, the youth poets, for sharing your perspectives and your powerful words and your profound talent with us tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you to Amanda and Alex for working with us to make tonight happen. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming. 
Um, we'd like to invite you to join us in the lobby for some refreshments and conversation, um, and also to participate in another piece of art created by young people, um, our collaborative mural created by Artists for Humanity Youth Artists. So thank you very much. Thank you.